It's still live on Facebook. It's all good. It's only live in the private group, though. So <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. No, I say that jokingly, but no, no maps. Maps, honestly, for for any of you that anyone that's had an experience with maps, um, you know, I think this is a fair criticism that we do talk about publicly. Is it was a very regimented coaching program for the longest time. Um, and with some changes in leadership and change in the, in the vision, you know, we do get to have these really amazing one-on-one -on -one relationships with our clients. So um, not to give too much away, uh, you know, Elise and I, we actually had a fun conversation about like building her brand. We used all kinds of like Harry Potter analogies during our, our coaching call. So um, it's a, uh, it's a fun thing that we can actually build a relationship together and, and kind of work on where you're at. Instead of just saying like, Hey, do it this way or else. Um, Cause that's not a fun way to coach. Yeah, and not to have like a commercial, but they do have breakthrough coaching, which is four fifty a month. It's two meetings a month that are a half hour, completely tax deductible because these are classes about how to grow your business. Um, and for me, it's been really enjoyable and a big benefit to my business. I feel like, well, Sam knows all my problems because he's a market center tech trainer and he's been an agent, so. He understands everything that I'm dealing with instead of just half of it. And I think that's really important when you're finding mentors and coaches and he's outside of our market. He's completely outside of the region even. So I think it brings um, a point of view that's not just our area to our businesses as well, which I think is really important. The more people that you work with, the more point of views that you have, the more creativity you can have in it. And I just think it's really good. So um, I don't want to have a commercial, but at the same time, I totally have to give Sam his plug. And um, he is here for free to, today. Thank you. <laughs> he is definitely here for free today. So we want to thank him so much for his time. And um, Sam, unless you need anything from me, I'm just going to give you the control. Yeah, let's, let's run with it. So, so thanks for having me. Um, I, and quite honestly, I love teaching and coaching outside my own market center too, because like I say the same things all the time and everyone's like, okay, Sam, I'm tired of hearing it, but I get new energy from all of you. So thank you for being with me today. Uh, for those of you who are both here on zoom and watching either recorded or on, on Facebook, but um, yeah, I wanted to take the time today and talk about this idea called lead gen, like a millionaire, um, which is a lot about, well, I don't want to give it away. Let's just go into the slides here, but this is honestly, I want to see a refreshing way of looking at lead generation. So um, either show a virtual hand or feel free to take yourself off mute and join us today. Whenever you hear the words lead generation, does it have the same connotation as like a, as a bad word for you? When I say lead generation, what emotions are attached to that normally? Money. I feel pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, money is the result, but a lot of times it's like, this is the work that we have to do to get there. And sometimes we make it feel like too much work and I think it's because we're not really doing the right activities. And what I mean by the right activities, I mean, they're not the activities that we enjoy doing naturally. And so we can either muscle up and get uncomfortable and grow and do these things until we like them, or we can find a way to live in our strength zone and still get uncomfortable and grow. So let's, let's jump into this today. Um, and I just realized I probably have an extra slide in here today because I taught this class on Friday for a market center and I included my son inside of the uh, the slide deck. So we're going to skip over him. But um, I'm Sam Jackson. I am the director of uh, innovation and technology for the Georgia Legacy Group. So I have um, the responsibilities of coaching and training technology for three offices in North Georgia. Uh, we have roughly 1400 agents. Um, all three of those market centers, I think combined, we've done like three and a half billion dollars in, in volume, um, big, big businesses. I think, uh, our North Atlanta office was number eighth last year in terms of profit. Uh, and we had, I think 14 millionaire real estate agents in our, in our group last year. Yeah. Some big, big teams and businesses, but, uh, as Elise mentioned, I'm also a maps technology coach and labs advisor. So I get to break uh, a lot of the KW tech before it gets into your hands, which is fun. Uh, I've been with KW since 2016 as the director of marketing for a large team. Uh, so I worked with the Karen Marshall group out of Pittsburgh. We did roughly $75 million every year. Uh, it was kind of our, our, our basement goal there. And I also ran a KW office for about two and a half years. So I know what it's like to run a KW office, the challenges that you face as a big rainmaker. 
And then today I'm an MCTT and a director of tech. And then here's my son who is my helper on my class on Friday. I'll update my slides. Um, but today we're going to jump into a lot of MREA2 material. So this is unreleased, unpublished material that will probably change again before it gets published. Uh, but feel free to take notes, take pictures, take screenshots, whatever it is you need to do. Just don't share this publicly. Um, like just don't go out and blast this to everyone inside of like Berkshire Hathaway, Cold Banker, you know, competing brokerages. We want this to kind of remain inside of KW. So Heather, do you know what the MREA is? Oh, great um, question. Um, I, I figured because she's been within like the last week and a half. Cool. Uh, like Heather, I'm, I'm very green. <laughs> yeah. Good. So after this, um, hopefully Jan has a copy that she can give you, if not order it off of Amazon, but it is the Millionaire Real Estate Agent. Oh, yes, I know what Gary that is. Keller. And I, Martin, have, I have the book. I'm reading it. Okay, yeah. perfect. I do you know what it is? Yeah. Martin is doing a class on it in both offices right now, RTL. So it, jump in, even if it's, because I think his has already started there as well, but jump in because each section can be taken on its own and he'll explain anything that needs to be connected. Um, it has a lot to do with models to run your business. And I, I, I noticed that I run a lead gen model, um, but then like every December and January, I run an economic model because we spend so much time talking about goal setting. <laughs> so, but for like 10 months of the year, I run a lead gen and for two months, I have an economic model. So it's really funny how it fluctuates. That was what we talked about two weeks ago was those mm -hmm. chapters. <laughs> it was cracking me up. So Gary is updating that book and that's why none of this can be released um, outside of our internal Okay. private Facebook groups. So I just wanted to take a second to explain it. Um, I'm so sorry for interjecting, Sam. <laughs> no, please do. Please do. Uh, no, I, I prefer to have an interactive class. So thanks for, thanks for filling me in, Elise. Uh, my advice though, when you get that book or you're reading the book, get a bunch of multicolored pens and commit to one color because you're going to read that book every year. And it's interesting to see what notes did I take last year when I read that book compared to this year? And then the next year, um, for me, that kind of helps. I have different colored tabs and different notes inside of here. Um, because every time you read it, you're a different person. Your business is different. Your business take on a different beast. So um, yeah, in, in KW, uh, we talk a lot about this book. There are four, four models that we, that we see inside this book, uh, at least covered two of them, but they're the economic lead generation budget and organization models. And those are the four foundational models that we basically run the play inside of KW. So when we say the red book or MRE2, and we talk about the models, we're talking about this book right here. This is, it's our playbook, which is cool because it's like 19 bucks on Amazon and anyone can get it, not just KW people. But this is an updated version. So this book was published and released in 2004. So there are some things that, very, very few things that aren't applicable today, um, but we're gonna go through that today. Cool. All right, and legal says hi. So in any training that we do now, just to make sure that you are not breaking the do not call uh, registry and uh, you know, not calling, you're not supposed to. So um, we good here. I don't have to spend all this time reading this. We're good. All right, legal says hi. We're good. All right. And on all of our sales meetings, if you're not familiar with this, contact Elisha or Jan. <laughs> yes, yeah. Cool, so what, what is a database? Uh, and this is the thing that we really want to dig into today because it's the most important thing that whether you're a brand new agent or a, a, a grizzled seasoned veteran, um, the database is the most important thing that you own as a real estate agent. And the goal is that we want to fill your database with people that know you, like you, trust you, and this big old star here says willing to do business with you. Now, for new agents, as a, as a team leader, I love sitting down and meeting with people that were saying, hey, I want to get my real estate license. I want to make 100K. And I would kind of joke with them of your success in your first year or even your first three years is going to be dependent on the people that know you, like you, and trust you, which is basically your family and friends. Now, don't be upset when your family and friends do not choose to work with you. It's just because we're missing that trust aspect. They know you. They obviously love you but they love you so much that they probably don't want to tarnish that relationship as a, as a friend or family member. And that's okay. We have time to build that trust. This is a very long game that we're going to play, but just know, and don't feel heartbroken. If somebody that you're really, really close to doesn't use you, 
we just got to think bigger and go find other people that will know us, like us, trust us, and will and will be willing to do business with us. But ultimately, the goal is that when we fill these uh, four stars, these four people, um, we're building a predictable business. So we have a documented return on investment. We can figure out how much your database is worth, depending on the people that you put in there that already know you, like you, and trust you, and are willing to do business with you. So updated MRE2 material, this is not suggesting that we go out and fill a database full of people that we don't know. This isn't going out and filling up a database full of a bunch of random strangers into our contact list and working from that. How great would it be if we just work with people we like, we know, and we trust? Then our closings aren't nearly as stressful because we know the people on the other side, personally. All right, so why do we need a database? Number one, it's to avoid the today trap. And the today trap looks like this. I'm running the roller coaster of real estate because I have needy clients. My buyers are out of town. So I couldn't lead generate today, right? How many times do we hear that of, oh, I have, I have these clients that are only in for this, this random Wednesday from nine to 11 when it's my lead generation time. So we gotta, we gotta just you know keep a database to keep us honest on these are the people that I truly need to call and not give up on and manage my time block better. It also eliminates those fires. Who's ever put out a fire in real estate? <laughs> At least your hand is not high enough. It should have been off the screen. It was so high. <laughs> yeah, fires happen. And honestly, as real estate agents, we often create them. Um, so the key thing here is that like, this keeps us honest of like, is this really a fire or can this actually go outside my lead generation time? I asked our broker a couple of weeks ago who she's very much like Deb. If you're in the Branson office, Connie is Connie and Deb are like one in the same. It's really freaky. Um, but I asked her, I was like, how do you have this like just chill level when everything seems to be falling apart? And she said, oh, honey, that's age. And I said, well, I need to age about 50 years in like <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> I was like, I need that level of chill because they're just so just like, okay, well, we have to take it one step at a time. So here's what we're going to do. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, the world's exploding. <laughs> well, and, and when you look at, uh, I'm not the biggest like follower of sports, but you see this in a lot of different, different aspects of the world that some of the like greatest leaders and the greatest athletes and the greatest performers of all time, they're always in control of their space. I hate the guy, but Tom Brady, you have to have a lot of respect. He's never had the most talented group around him, but he's always had control over the game. And you can apply that to whatever it is that you follow. There's always somebody who's at the best of what they do. They typically have control. They don't let those fires take over. They don't let their injury or, or uh, you know, flat tire, whatever it is, break them. They have control of both their emotions and the situation. So uh, the, the, I don't know, the better you get at mastering that, the easier this becomes. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, riding that roller coaster. So, you know, a lot of agents, when they go, oh, it's feast or famine, I'm riding the roller coaster of all of a sudden my business dried up. It's because we focus on working just our clients and giving up on that lead generation. So as I get four or five clients and I feel super busy and I say, okay, I don't need to lead generate. I need to go focus on these people. You're creating that roller coaster. You're building that roller coaster. And because we know that once you close those four people, you weren't doing the right activities that gave you consistent business. And those right activities is lead generation, specifically prospecting and marketing. We're talking about that in a minute. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the other reason why, why we keep a, a database is this actually gives us a documented ROI that if you can tell me the total number amount of people that you have in your database, I can tell you how much money you're going to make that year. The MREA, the current version of this, the published version of this says that for every 12 people, we should get two pieces of business. Now, I am not the savviest math person in the world, but I'm like 12 to two, that's six to one. Why, why do we write it that way? It doesn't make sense. Uh, and the reason for that is that for every 12 people, you're getting two units, but those units are very different. One is repeat business and the other one is referral. So if you're doing a great job of mastering real estate, you should get a unit from that person and a referral from that person. So that's why we call that 12 to two. Uh, MREA two, the new version of this book, the new numbers for 2020 to 2023 
we're looking at it's probably closer to just a straight up 10 to one. So we're actually getting less from our database than what we did in 2004. So, which I kind of love only from the sense of I can do math in, in tens. That's really easy. <laughs> so um, I am sure that you will cover things like this in the training, but I instantly had a question when you said that it had changed. Do we have any suspicions as to why? Consumers have changed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Con consumers have changed. They're, they're, um, they're, they're, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how do I want to say this? Their, their appreciation, their relationships with realtors have also changed. Um, I didn't have this prepared for today's slides, but feel free to do this on your own. It's, it's eye opening. Go to Google and search realtors R. So just realtors A R E. And then watch what Google suggests for the, um, the auto filler. It's not good. One of the top six most untrusted professions in the country outside of lawyers. Yeah, we look like used car salesmen online. We have a crazy really bad reputation. It blew my mind that we were in like the top three. Yeah, and Heather's like, oh, I didn't know that getting in. <laughs> um, and, and I'll kind of hopefully show you why. Um, I think a lot of times we're a little bit too corny in our approach that we're giving too many direct offers, you know, saying, Hey, this is Sam Jackson. Who do you, you know, who do you know is going to buy, sell, invest in real estate? I think if we start doing less of that and more of what we're going to talk about in today's class, um, we can help do some damage control with our reputation as real estate agents. We can always do better. Um, this is a little bit of a joke with the punchline, but has anyone ever heard of the, uh, the retired realtor? They don't exist. They don't exist. No, not in our market. I've got like a 96 year old man, the grandfather of real estate here, still doing it. <laughs> and they just gradually fall out of business. They don't get any more. It's not that they chose to retire by choice. So the reason for that is they probably didn't have a database or at least not a strong enough one that tells us specifically what their database is worth. Um, we are starting to see that we're having that conversation inside of maps. We have several people who've done this, but there's this concept that didn't exist ever before in real estate called the golden handoff. That if I do the right activities, that if I have the right database, I have an asset that I can technically sell. Um, have any of you ever, ever went to like a family doctor and then all of a sudden that practice was purchased by someone else? What did that new doctor purchase? What did they buy? They bought the entire business, the client list, the building, all of the supplies, the staff, all the responsibilities, all the expenses, the liability. They bought all of it. And it's so funny that you bring that up because Martin and I have been purposefully having conversations with some of the people that I manage uh, social media for because obviously Martin knows that that's where I want to be is to be in a position to buy the databases and so it's like okay well you've already got at least in these so what if at least helps you build them to where it's sellable and then maybe you give you at least first shot yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know like i may not want to and there's some databases that i may not want to buy from somebody just because of whatever reasons but um, age of clients is one of the biggest reasons that I have, because if all the clients are passing away, I'm going to need the kids' contact information, not necessarily theirs. Um, and it, with this being a second home market, we do work with a lot of older clients. So that's a legitimate thing to think about. But um, I am so glad that you're having this conversation, because I think that a lot of people don't think about retirement and um, I don't know how accurate this is, but Martin was telling me that a database is worth about two to three times what it generated in um, not commissions and commissions in the last 12 months. So, and I'm sure that that fluctuates per market. That may not be the going rate in Georgia, who knows? Um, but when you start thinking of it like that, my mentor's database is worth over a million. And that is like, wow, so that's like a retirement plan. <laughs> uh, I mean, it could be a really big retirement plan. Well, the, going back to the example of, of the doctor's office, 
um, this is why doctor's offices are, are, are great to things to purchase if you're in that position, because, um, you know, there's, there's regulation, there's laws, there's rules around what somebody has to keep on file. They have really good data. Like I could open up my, my doctor's, uh, my physician's file. And I could see that, like what shots I had as a baby, right. I can see my dental records. I can see all my immunizations. I can see every broken bone, every x-ray scan that I've had in the last 35 years of my life. We have 35 years of data on me. A lot of real estate agents aren't even logging the last time they had a phone call with one of their clients. So the data is not that great. Um, so it's hard to say, hey, that's worth a million dollars if there's not data. Because um, oftentimes we're just so busy looking for our next deal that we're not thinking long term of like, how much interaction do I truly have with this person? how much business has this one person given me? Cause there may be gems inside of your database that are worth more than any deal that you've ever had with them. You know, I, I love talking to our big teams because they, they get this, like our MRA teams get this and they say, some of my best people have never closed a deal with me. They give me business. They recommend business to me, but I've never bought or sold a house with them. But it's filling like a database full of those people. And not that you have to be something special, like you don't have to be a raving fan. The goal is that we just build relationships and relationships are rocket ships. But think bigger of, I'm not just looking for my next deal. I'm looking on data that I can eventually sell one day. I'm looking on relationships that hopefully I can hand off to somebody else and make money off of. I can retire or leave a BA um, legacy with. All right, so these are these are what we call the four laws of a database. And um, I'm doing this top top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. I probably should have numbered these. Um, but step number one is we have to feed it consistently. So what's that mean? Need to have something feeding into it. Yeah, my goal is to either meet new people, whether that's through online leads, through some type of marketing, or just going out and getting more relationships that, that I can I can nurture. But the goal here is that if I need to grow, if I need to make a million dollars in real estate, and this is the this is the new number, if I want to make a million dollars in my database every year, I need 6,000 contacts in my database. That's the magic number. Say that again. Uh, to be an MREA agent, you have to have 6,000 contacts in your database. 6,000 contacts equals a million dollars. And is that a million in commissions? GCI. Okay, that's what I Every year. Yeah, every year. Really? And what's, what, what's the acronym of GCI again? Gross commission income. So that's like the big paycheck before anything gets taken out of it. Told you I was green. Yeah, that's okay. I, get, I have season agents that figure out what net and, and gross means. It's all good. Um, but yeah, we need to feed it consistently. And we're going to talk about what that looks like today in, in a couple of slides here. Um, the law number two is we need to segment it into groups. Now, I, I, love, I love talking about this because it's, I think it's funny. Um, there's probably, not that I have multiple personalities that I'm aware of anyways, but there's probably eight different versions of Sam Jackson that lives out there in, in the eyes of people that I, I, I love, right? Like there's... There's the Sam Jackson that's a son. There's the Sam Jackson that's a brother. There's the Sam Jackson there's a friend. There's the Sam Jackson that's a coach. There's the Sam Jackson that's a, um, a friend. Um, there's all these different versions of me that are out there. And depending on the group that I'm communicating with, they see a different version of me. Show of hands, who talks to their mom the same way they talk to their best friend? Mm-mm. I would lose all of my coaching clients if they could see the text feed that I had with my friends. They're like, who's that guy? <laughs> like, right? like <laughs> that's, that's not Sam, right? Like we show up as different people depending in on theory, the group that we're in. Handsome. I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, I make it. Yeah. You may hate a few. <laughs> yeah. I think there's definitely a few that would, yeah, they would, yeah. No, nah. but, but we have different personalities depending on the ease that we have with that group. And so oftentimes the mistake we make as real estate agents is that we don't, we don't, differentiate with those groups. And one thing I forgot is like, you may have a church group, you may be super polished with another organization or, you know, volunteers, things like that. 
But oftentimes when we go to, to law number three, which is engage it with a touch plan, we try to do this one size fits all communication. And we probably sound like a weird version of this polished up professional church going version. And then we send it to our friends and they go, who the hell is that person? <laughs> like Sam's selling again. Cause I sound like I'm selling again. But if my touch plan matched the group that I'm communicating to, if my tone matched the group, I'm going to get in stronger relationships with the people because I'm talking to them the way I talk to them. So a lot of times as the, as the tech trainer and tech coach, people come to me and they say, Sam, I need to create a touch plan for my database. Where can I find a 36 touch? And I go, don't. Don't send a one size fits all approach out to your database because you're not going to build relationships that way. You're just you doing be, it because you want the easy button. You need to be more personable. Hell yeah. That's that, what pe like, people are missing that nowadays. I mean, in the class here. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, Because I've done marketing and advertising for over 30 years and awesome. databases, like, it's one of my things. I love it. Um, I do have a fear of talking to people because I feel like I'm selling to people. But the older you get, you just start. You just start learning people, you start recognizing what they like, and then it brings that, it blooms that conversation organically because you're interested in them instead of, and put that sale out to a side. It's about them. It's about their dog. It's about their, their kids. It's about, you know, did they go get surgery? Are they, are they trying to beat cancer? Um, when you start treating any of your groups in the manner that they want to be respected as, then that's a natural conversation that goes into. And then they automatically say, hey, what are you doing lately? Because you've dealt so much in with them. And then they're like giving it over, you know, and then now you can talk about what you're doing. So well, even, I, if, even if the what are you doing conversation doesn't come up, I'm still building a great relationship with that person. I don't need yeah. that immediately every single conversation. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we, we look at the value of a person in our database of the value in the world of like what they can give me. Stop, stop that. Give it all away. Right. Right. It comes back. It's to you. about them. Yeah. Yep. There's a great book on it called the go-giver Bob by Bob Berg. Um, that's a quick, easy read. I, I did it on audible. Um, the go-giver talks about that, that concept of just give it all away. Just be a giving person and watch how it comes back to you. Which What's goes, which, which it connects with being a uh, customer service. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really does. It's great PR. Yeah. Ritz Carlton, right? About making your clients the hero. No, that, that's building a story brand. That's the one we talked about a couple weeks ago. Yeah. That one was really good. Um, like great book. after the, after the first 30 pages, it was super, <laughs> super good. And I did download the free resources just to see what it was. And some of it good. was useful. But um, that's a good one on Audible. It's like four and a half hours. It's super short. Um, yep. That was a really good one as well. And I really took that to heart. And um, that helped me land the $1.3 million listing that I have coming next week. Um, because I was willing to do things that other agents weren't doing to help them get to the next chapter of their life. They, my client's son lives in Arizona. And my client went into assisted living. So it's how can I, as someone that's on the ground here, help you get rid of this house? <laughs> because... yeah, the, 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 two, the two parallels between those books, The Go-Giver and Building a Story Brand, they're very, very completely different books. The parallel is stop trying, stop trying to be the hero in someone else's story. Be a guide, be a helper, be a connector. Yeah, the support staff, which is really yeah. funny because when I play Xbox, I'm, I like love first person shooters, so I'm a lot of Call of Duty, but I'm the support cover fire that has the ammo box and stuff. Like that's always the character that I thrive the most with. Like it's so weird when you think about things like that. And then you're like, well, I'm this in real life. Like I've yeah, always yeah. been really good at this in real life. And it's so weird to think about it because you're, you don't think about that when you sign into the Xbox. You're just like, whatever, I'm playing Call of Duty. <laughs> You don't well, dissect it. <laughs> it's it's all about a team win, right? And, and your team is different depending on on what space you're in. Um, so so the going back to the um, engaging with a touch plan. So, you know, it's it's super important that um, our tone matches the group. So that segmenting part, don't skip it, right? I think a lot of people forget that part. And inside command, I, I use tags mostly to, to create my groups. I think that's the easiest way to do that. 
any database, whatever you're using, you can do it any way you need to, but break them into groups, break them in tags, break them the flags, whatever it is your, your system calls it. Um, don't skip that part. Um, but when you're engaging with the touch plan, I think oftentimes our touches suck as real estate agents, which is probably also why we have the reputation we do when you go to Google's. Um, this is not in the slide, so, so write this down, but you should have a, a standard for your touches. So before you hit the send button or before you mail out whatever you're doing or whatever it is that you're delivering the message, you need to stop and, and plan this ahead of time. But before you at least send it, at least ask yourself, does it check off one of these three boxes? Um, and if it doesn't, scratch it and do it over again. But the three things that your touch should do, and you only have to do one of these, but it should um, make your clients remember you in a favorable way. So an example of this, uh, I'm working with a coaching client in, in California. Um, she owns horses, race horses, um, does all kinds of fun stuff. Her, her, her network is really the equestrian group. This past, the past two weeks, she did a, a huge drive for the local animal shelter. She, she actually like got tons of food donated from her database, from her farm. She put a flyer out with a, with a bag accepting goods. And in the last couple of weeks, she had, I think, three horse trailers full of dog food for the local animal shelter. She actually had to stop. She received too much. So it's not tied to real estate right? Like other than her being the realtor who cares about that thing. It had no, no attachment to real estate whatsoever. Ever, I'm not stroking out. Um, did not have any attachment to real estate, but all, all it did was it showed that um, she's passionate about her purpose and her purpose is dogs and the people kind of dug into that, but it made people remember her. Um, whatever it is for you, you know, I think a lot of times I'm reminded of this agent that I couldn't stand whenever I was a team leader in, in Pittsburgh. Part of it was is that he wasn't my agent, so he, he annoyed me. But his name was Wild Bill, and I won't give his last name, but he had the dumbest billboard that I could ever think of. It was just like this really crappy billboard that it looks like it was created probably in Microsoft Word. There was no like true marketing done on it, but it's just his headshot, not even his headshot, but like a profile of him. He says, I'm Wild Bill, and he had like finger guns in his picture, and it, it annoyed me. Um, but like for his group, there are people that are drawn to that. Like he was authentically wild bill, but I don't know. So you can be a caricature. Like you can go that route of making yourself a really big, obnoxious brand if you want, or you can go the, the route of just having a purpose that people buy into whatever it is, just make sure that when you send something out, you're consistent in that touch that makes people remember you in a favorable way. And there's two ends of that spectrum that I just gave you. <laughs> Not saying that you have to live in extremes and yet there's, there's a way to do that. So, so number one is make people remember you in a, in a favorable way. Number two is make your clients smarter. We think way too often that people know more about real estate than they do. Um, there was actually a, a stat um, about a year ago that showed that 80% of homeowners don't know what their home is worth. We assume that everyone knows what their home is worth. We don't ask them, hey, do you know what your home is worth? That would be making your client smarter if we can say like, hey, your home's probably worth in this range just when give you a yearly update. And we're not talking about the stupid Zillow report thing. This is like legit what your home is worth. Because Zillow's not allowed in our MLS and I think they're not allowed in the Branson one either. So their numbers can be wildly inaccurate when they don't have access to the MLS. So if somebody says, I know what my house is worth, I looked on Zillow. You have a small well, of ammunition of, well, Zillow doesn't necessarily use correct comps. Let's take a deeper dive into it and don't make it sound like Zillow's terrible. Just say, let's take a deeper dive and let's legitimately look at the comps in your area. And usually that'll keep them off that Zillow conversation. And then they're more accepting of the deeper dive conversation. Just well, even, even without the deeper dive, can I, can I share kind of a dissenting opinion on this? The, the one that changed my perception of this too because i thought the same thing of like this estimates garbage right like <laughs> i think it's wildly inaccurate um uh this was a couple months ago now time time has passed it's actually sold but um 
I don't, it, it amazes me. I live in a, in a, a subdivision that has, I think we have 120 homes which is relatively small for the subdivisions in the Atlanta market, but like, it's still a pretty big subdivision. Um, I, I bought in March of 2020, I got super lucky. Like we were probably the first people that kind of closed when it was weird. Like my wife and I weren't at the closing table at the same time. It was like when COVID was really, really scary and we didn't know what we were going into. Um, we sold for 419. The house that we purchased was on the market for over 65 days. And we actually got seller's assist. The sellers paid for closing for us. Yeah, good timing. We had no idea it was going to happen in April of 2020, but we got lucky in March of 2020. Um, but I've lived in this house for two, two years and, and a couple months. I've received one piece of mail from real estate agents since, since I've moved in. Uh, and let me back that up. I actually haven't received mail from a real estate agent. I received mail from a real estate brokerage that rhymes with Schmoffer pad. They sent a postcard out and it was just like a fun little bifold one. It wasn't anything special on the outside of it. It just had my address in the top right hand corner. It just said your home may be worth between <laughs> get this 400 and $500,000. Pretty big gap. <laughs> now I'm in real estate. You're in real estate. We all know that that's a very crappy analysis, right? Um, however, shortly after receiving that postcard in the mail. Oh, um, let me back up. Um, anyways, when you opened up the flyer after that range, when you put the flyer, it said, here's all the reasons why you need to, to list with Schmoffer pad or sell your home to Schmoffer pad. And down below is all the reasons why you shouldn't work with a traditional real estate agent. Basically it was just, Hey, they're too expensive, which is the dumbest thing ever. Cause that person definitely didn't get the value they needed from their house. Um, but that was it. Simple flyer, like more or less bifold with a crappy message on the outside. And sure enough, 10 days later, there's a new listing in my, my neighborhood. Sadly, it had this terrible bright orange crappy schmoffer pad T sign in the front directly across the street from the top Berkshire Hathaway agent in my, my neighborhood. And I love Peggy. Pe Peggy's wonderful. I'm not talking crap because she's, she's incredible. She's at the wrong brokerage at the moment. Um, sadly, this is the time that everyone's getting well, their awards. You're working on that though, right? Mm -mm, no, nah, she's great. I'm not touching her. She's good. <laughs> Um, but, uh, directly across the street is, is Peggy's home and Peggy just got recognized as the top agent at Berkshire Hathaway from her office. So she literally has the step-in sign that says award-winning Berkshire Hathaway agent lives here directly across the street from this really crappy Schmoffer pad listing. I was heartbroken to see that, but my takeaway was the general consensus of the neighborhood doesn't know what their home is worth. If they weren't looking at real estate, they're not paying attention to it. They don't know the value that they have. They don't know what the market looks like if they're not looking, unless we're telling them what that is. So educate your database, make that be one of your standards that if I can't make them remember me in a favorable way, this touch has to be educating them on something. And the easiest thing is like, basically what's your home worth or what's going on in the area? How are, what's the market look like? Let's hit them with the statistics, things like that. Um, the other stuff you can do is like, really fun things like decorating stuff. Like, Hey, here's the best way to decorate your house for the, for the summer or, you know, whatever, but you're making someone smarter with this touch plan. Uh, and then the third bucket here, if you can't do those first two of make them, make them remember you in a favorable way, uh, you can't make them smarter. The third and probably the most complicated is solve a problem. And again, we assume that our, our, database, our clients, our people know more than what they do. And it's not saying they're dumb. They're just not paying attention to real estate. They're, they're focusing on what they focus on, which is different from us because we focus on real estate. What's the biggest problem right now in real estate? That's a difficult question. Oh, oh come on. You're, you're in the field. What do sellers okay, say well, right now? I would love to sell my home, <laughs> but... <laughs> They don't have anywhere to go. Yeah, I hear that buying is crazy right now. I don't want to go become a buyer that's going to go into multiple yeah. offers and potentially be homeless. And I hear that pricing all things accurately because the market's moving so fast. Um, we've been seeing things like by the time appraisal actually happens 25 days after we go under contract, things are worth more than they were when we listed. So then like the seller's kind of bummed because it appraises for over the last 
and then I'll be like, working with well, a different appraiser if they're doing that by the way you you know drop the ball and it's like well the market's different <laughs> you know but um yeah I had that at the beginning of the year and I was like devastated because it was like twenty thousand dollars higher yeah you're you're well we'll talk offline <laughs> i don't say anything on a, on a recording that's line. a coaching moment is what he's saying <laughs> yeah well yeah your your appraiser shouldn't be give like typically we see appraisers saying hey because you only you only have appraisal if there's a mortgage right um and what you should see is an appraiser come in and say yes for the mortgage amount that we agreed upon the house is worth this it's like a yes no statement not a not a range that's what we hope for anyways um but the biggest problem that I, that I think we hear right now is, yes, I would love to list my home. I think I can make money by listing my home. And yet I don't want to go become a buyer because I hear being a buyer is terrible right now. And, and, the, and the consumer fear is, is I'm going to be homeless. I'm not going to find a place to buy. I sold my home and now I'm not going to have a place to buy. And so we take for granted that the consumers don't know the things that we know. And so we have to solve that problem for them. We can say, hey, Mr. Mr. Seller, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I know that there are different markets, but I believe this is true across the country. Y'all have some contingencies that you can put in place that keeps that seller in that home for as long as they need to. The consumers don't know that. They don't know about lease backs. They don't know about delayed closing dates. We absolutely do. And there's even a Missouri state form that does it. Yeah. Tell your clients this. Tell your database this. They don't know that. It's so common knowledge for us, but they don't know that. So when you engage in a touch plan, we need to um, make your clients remember you in a favorable way, solve a problem, and make them smarter. If you're sending out something that's not doing that, don't send it. And I'm going to be very, very specific here. I'm going to call out somebody who's probably watching or listening to this that needs to hear this. It's not seed packets. It's not recipe cards. Stop sending that stuff. No, I'm not frozen. I'm silent deliberately. I want you to hear that. Stop sending that stuff. Okay. And this one should be a no-brainer, but the fourth law of the database is that if you get business from your database, if somebody's waving their hand saying, I need, I need you, work with them. It amazes me the amount of agents that let stuff fall through the cracks because they have crappy systems in place. You have people in your database that are telling you that they need you and then you forget. You're relying on your memory instead of a system. That should never happen. If it happens once, it's too many times. If it happens twice, you're a bad agent. I'm being direct now. This is a version of Sam that needs, that you need to hear this. Don't lose business. All right, it's gonna be fun again. All right. <laughs> so what are the challenges? I mean, kind of what we just talked about, agents play the short game. I'm so busy working on my deals. I need the next deal. I need the next deal. We're not looking this long-term. And we give up. We give up on lead generation. We give up on the activities. We do it once and say, oh, that didn't work. I remember when I went to the gym once. Yeah. I didn't get the body I wanted when I went to the gym once. I ate healthy for a day. I didn't see my cholesterol drop, right? We have to do these things over time until we start to see the, the fruit of tomorrow. The other thing is you cannot rely on charm and charm alone. You cannot build a business around your personality. Y'all have Chick-fil-A in your area? No, Heather's saying, yeah. Branson does. Our okay. closest one's 45 minutes away. I wish I would have known that or else I wouldn't have moved here. <laughs> All right. What's, what's Chick-fil-A known for? My pleasure. My pleasure. And, and really, it's their system. Like when I go in there, I'm like, it's amazing. I hit the drive through and it's like a well-oiled machine. Like it's fantastic. Yeah. They figured out I, their I system. Don't, I don't understand why McDonald's and Burger King hasn't picked up on it. Good question. Well, they probably they probably invest in more marketing than the Chick Fil A. I don't know that I've ever seen it. Well, there's a couple Chick Fil A commercials, but so yeah. Chick Fil A and Culver's both require their franchise owners to be on site for a designated amount of hours a week. 
Thank you for using the magic word. You just teed that up for me. It's like you, it's like you read my mind, Elise. Because well, my next statement was, <laughs> my, my, the next statement I was going to make is when you go to Chick-fil-A or McDonald's, any of them really, is it the franchise owner who fries your chicken sandwich? Is it the franchise owner that spins your milkshake? Is it the franchise owner that hands you the bag of food? Is it the franchise owner that takes your order at the beginning? I don't think I've ever seen a franchise owner. They, I'm glad they're required on site. I've never seen one. Actually, the one that we have here, he's on site quite often. Good for him. My dad. He's also the he's also the number one Chick Fil A in in like the huge region here. So. Well, he's a terrible example for my point today. But what I want, what I want to get across <laughs> is that you have to have models and systems. Typically, it's a bunch of pimply faced sixteen year olds that run that they run that show. Chick Fil A has a has models and systems in place that gets repeat and referral business. They've created an experience that I want to go back to because it's so smooth. And it's usually a bunch of 16 year olds who run a simple play. So when you look at your business, whether you intend to grow a team or not, don't rely on just you. Rely on building systems that other people can fit into. Um, when I, when I SOP. work for. Have your sorry. SOPs. SOPs. What are SOPs? System operating procedures. Yeah. KW, we call that models huge. and systems. Yeah. Always, any business, any business should have them. And that's oftentimes when we talk about that golden handoff, the retiring agent, a lot of times it's because they rely on charm. They rely on their personality. They say, hey, I can't give this away. This has been my client for the last 30 years. Or you did it wrong then. They should have bought into your systems, not your ownership. They don't need you to do every transaction. They need your standards that you created. That's really the difference between Chick-fil-A and McDonald's is probably the standards that they accept. If I had to guess, I don't know the restaurant world all that well. And yet, if I had to guess, it's the standards. Because at the end of the day, the difference between Popeye's and Chick-fil-A is just the brand. It's the systems. They both have crappy fried chicken sandwiches, right? There may be some differences there, but like at the end of the day, it's a fried chicken company. Same thing with KFC, but one of those stands out. Why? Systems. Standards. Okay. So when we talk about the three levels of a millionaire database, this is uh, updated MRE2 material. So this is something that's never been, never been seen before in the current version of this book. Um, but we have three levels of a database. And this is usually where when you're getting started, you probably have this. And it looks like this thing right here, your cell phone. But level one consists of these four things. You have a name, hopefully. You have contact information, hopefully. Um, and I pray to God that you have a physical address because it's really hard to sell real estate when you don't know where your people live. I'm going to repeat that. It's really hard to sell real estate when you don't know where your people live. So if you look at your database and you have a bunch of names and emails and phone numbers, you don't have enough. You don't have a business yet. Again, going back to my doctor's office, they have 35 years of records on me. You don't even know where people flip and live and you're in real estate. How are you going to sell their house? You don't know where they live. Number three is you have some dialogue. You have some type of note of the past business you've done with them. They're tagged as a, a past client, a buyer, a seller, or you at least know where you know them from. I know that this person's tagged for my church group. I know this person's an ex coworker, whatever. But you have what's called at will communication. The goal here is that they hopefully have your number and their cell phone. That when you call, you, something comes up on caller ID. Level two, and this is where we start to see millionaire real estate agents start to develop, is that we hit level two, which means that we're starting to go and we're growing this, right? We're getting permission-based contacts now. We're not relying on just our immediate circle. We're going out and getting bigger. So what's one way that you obtain permission to contact people? At an open house, what's the thing that you have people do? They sign in. Yeah, and what are we getting when they sign in? Their the permission to call them. Information, whether or not they're working with an agent already. Um, and then I usually ask for their address and use the lame excuse of I'm old school and I like to send birthday cards. Who doesn't want to receive something that's not a bill in the mail? 
Well, from a stranger that I don't know yet, I'm not sure that I'm giving that away. You're getting my fake address, at least. We'll talk about that. We'll talk. We'll talk on Monday. <laughs> but you'd be surprised how many real ones I get after the conversation. True. Like after, because I usually ask for them to sign up after we've done the walkthrough. So then, like they, we've we've kind of talked for probably about 45 minutes at that point. And so then, I don't know. They they seem to be very willing here in this market. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, if you're getting it, it's great. I'm not going to, I'm not going to complain about that. Um, but you're obtaining permission. And so like that shows up at open houses that shows up when we run Facebook ads, it shows up in many different ways, but what we're doing is we're getting the opportunity and we're getting permission to actually reach out to this person because our relationship is now real estate related. It's not based on my friend group that's over here. This is not real estate related. It's a different type of relationship. Now our goal is that we want to make them our friends. We want to make them feel special. We want to make them feel like they're the only person we're working with. But the goal here is in the level two, we're collecting as much personal information as we possibly can. We're getting the addresses, but also we're getting insights and preferences. We want to know why they're moving. What's their motivation? Um, for those of you that did, uh, you know follow like the pivot shift group, we're talking about the LP mama model uh, and give that a Google. I'm not going to cover it today, but basically it's like, I want to know like what location are they looking at? What's their motivation? Um, you know, are they finance? Things like that. Those are the baselines. We're also looking at segments one through six. So it's all that contact information, things that we mentioned right before this. But our goal here is that we're going to implement purposeful and consistent communication with the goal that we're building a relationship with them. Hopefully this is a relationship that's going to spike very quickly from a personal relationship into a transaction, transactional relationship. But ultimately we're building relationships. And then level three is all of those things, but we're just figuring out a way to automate it. Now, when I say automate, I'm not talking that we're going to have robots and AI and all these things come in and do this stuff for you. It's just pointing out insights and it's pointing out things that you could do more effectively. I can send a, an email out automatically. I don't have to go type that one-to-one. -one. I can have the system remind me that it's someone's birthday. I don't have to go figure that out every day. But the goal here is that I have something telling me what I need to do with my database. But I love this quote, and this is actually, I think this is going to make it into the next, the next red book. Well, I'm assuming it's red, but the new MREA. He who counts on his memory has a fool for a filing system. If you're relying on this, you're in trouble. Don't do that. All right. So what level is your database? For most agents, it's probably maybe at a 0.5 to a 1.5. The people on stage at Femarine and Mega Camp, the people that we model after, they're to three. All right. So this is an update to the new MREA book because quite honestly, um, we got it wrong in this edition. This edition of the book, the one that currently exists is that you need to be marketing based and prospecting enhanced. We're flipping that. We're saying in the, in the new updated model, and this is the conversations that we're having at MAPS and, and hopefully your leadership as well, is that you need to be prospecting based marketing enhanced. And I'm going to ask this as a live question. What is, give me an example, or, or can you tell me the difference between prospecting and marketing? And Heather, you're like, I did 30 years of marketing and I'm going to question everything that I did in life. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, you know, 30 years, there's so many changes that's happened in marketing and advertising within 30 years, like every decade it changes. So, yeah. And so, yeah. So, so the biggest difference to be really crystal clear about this is that when you prospect, you're in charge of the activity. Okay. When you market, it's up to your clients to respond. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Makes for example, sense. prospecting would be I can go out and I can door knock and I can door knock and door knock and door knock until I get a lead. I can keep doing that. That's prospecting. Marketing is I go put a billboard on the busiest highway. I still did something, right? I did something, but it's up to a person who sees it to contact me. Is prospecting also open houses? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood because marketing, because prospecting is when you are actively doing something, physically doing something. Marketing is when you take your tools and your materials and it's working for you. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. It's well, to, to highlight the one word here, it's passive. 
right? It's working when I'm not. Where prospecting is absolutely proactive. I can go knock on another door. I can go call another for sale by owner. I can go call another expired. I can always do one more to go get another lead. So my Facebook ads are marketing, even though they're kind of passive. Facebook and social media is 100% marketing. Okay. It's no different than a billboard, but it's in digital yes. digital form. Yes. And I'm going to, I'll bring clarity uh, on this in the next slide, but um, we want to be prospecting based marketing enhanced because we can only control our actions. We can't control people to go contact our billboard. We can get better content, right? We can make it a better call to action, a better offer that will make more people call it. And yet there's only so many people that will call off a billboard. However, I can put my boots on and I can go door knock all day, every day. But the marketing, even though you're on the billboard, it's a reminder every time they drive by it every day. And then there's going to be that one day they're like, oh, that billboard's been there for a while because that, that's just happened to me. So, yeah. Um, so that's, it's there. that's the long term so, results, right? That needs to sit there for a while a where door knocking, time. I can get immediate results. Mm -hmm. When I was in uh, marketing for different companies and my own company, a lot of people would not want to pay for more than a month of marketing. And I'm like, that doesn't work. I'm <laughs> like, you're not going to get it, anything from that. I said, you need at least 90 days, if not more. Six oh, but usually. I can't yeah. afford it. I can't afford it. I'm like, stick with it. Pro I promise, I promise, I promise you will see a return. So a yep. lot of people like to quit within 30 days and that doesn't work. Heather, you crushed all my bullet points. And that's the other difference too. It's money intensive versus time intensive. Doesn't cost me anything to go door knock. Yeah. And you got free social media. So, you yeah. know. Well, and, and social media technically can be prospecting. It depends on how you're using it. If you're private messaging a bunch of people, that's technically Facebook door knocking. Yeah, that's well, you do door knocking. It's a lot safer. <laughs> yeah. If you do like Instagram live or Facebook live, that's prospecting. Uh, I would argue that's live. more that's more marketing. Well, if it's live because you're on demand answering people's questions like you're knocking on their door. Now they can see the recording later, but I I would just argue I think it depends on what you're what you're discussing, right? Like if I'm just going live and just chatting and talking about nothing that could be more marketing. Um, but like, if you're, if you're intentionally doing a, like a digital seminar, I guess, of like, maybe I'm going to hold an investor conversation live on, on Facebook, that could be technically prospecting. Just kind of probably depends on your content. If you were to get down the nitty gritty of that. Um, so this is a, this is an MRE update as is this screen right here. Uh, this currently is on page 138 of the current book um, with a couple of like, Updates. Number one, this book was uh, released in 2004. Uh, Facebook wasn't released until 2005. So we didn't have social media in 2004. What a simpler time. <laughs> um, but you will see some updates to this. It. Yeah. So, so I want to, and I would love to hear, uh, you know, even on the recording, look back on this. I'm going to ask a question and, and take notes here. When you look at all the different forms of prospecting and marketing that you see here, how many are you doing currently? Well, I've only been in the game for a couple of days, so. <laughs> it's okay. So I'm even for calling, the recording. I'm calling my yeah. contacts. I see eight. That's the number I often hear. Seven or eight is usually the response I get. Um, congratulations. If you have the high score, you're, you're, you're losing. <laughs> Comment below with your high score. <laughs> yeah, the high score is not what you want here. We so would we'll, like to help you. Trimming. So what we realized that the top agents are doing is they're doing three things from this entire list. They're picking two forms of prospecting and enhancing that with one form of marketing. And I used this phrase once already, but I'm going to use it again because it's the most fitting here. You do not want to be a jack of all trades, master of none. When you do eight things at level one, you're not really doing them effectively. But if you can do three things at level 10, that's whenever you're really growing a massive business. Because each of these things require different skill and different energy. And quite honestly, you're probably not good at eight things. 
So focus on your strength zone and pick the things that you would enjoy doing. There's this concept that we, we kind of talk about in maps called painless prospecting. What is it that you already do for fun that you could turn into lead generation? Whether it's on this list or not, what, what do you enjoy doing that could turn into lead generation? Um, so I mentioned that my office is, uh, we created, really, we, we helped create because they, they were a big part of it, um, 14 MRE agents in, in our group. The very first one did it just a few years ago. So we started with one and it took off the 14 in a matter of two years. But the first to do it, her name is Robin Martin. She's out of our Kevin Williams North Atlanta office. And it was so cool because we're like, Robin, you're the first person to ever do this in our office. Like, let's celebrate you. We had her on the team meeting, interviewed her, celebrated her. We had like the money cannon or like the money guns and how all this really fun stuff. Um, but then we interviewed her. And we said, hey, Robin, how did you do it? And she goes, I play a lot of tennis. <laughs> we're like, okay, tell us more. And she goes, well, I turned tennis into lead generation. She goes, I play uh, doubles tennis. And whether you're familiar with tennis or not, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown. Um, so when you play doubles, it's basically two on two. So if you're one of those people, you basically are playing with three people. And so she plays tennis three days a week. That gives her an opportunity to basically have nine appointments a week. I don't know that you can do that forever because we have things called knees that tend to go out over time. And yet um, she, tur she turned what she loved doing into lead generation. Now, what made, what made her go from entrepreneurial to purposeful is that she did not play with the same nine people every week. She was intentional about playing with new people within her neighborhood. She lives in a massive subdivision here in Georgia. We have a lot of those. So she's able to play with nine different people every week. Do what you love and turn it into lead generation. Go from entrepreneurial to purposeful. It's entrepreneurial to play tennis and legion from it, it's really purposeful to say, hey, I'm going to meet with nine different people every single week. Another example of this, I have a coaching client in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Um, he does three different things every week, but there are three things that he, he enjoys doing. Um, he goes to church every Sunday, and he's not lead generating a church, but his goal at church is that he wants to invite one person to breakfast the next morning. So on Mondays, he meets with somebody that he goes to church with, just has breakfast and conversation with them. On, uh, I think it's, yeah, Wednesdays and Thursdays, there's other days. On, on Wednesdays, he goes to the shooting range. Well, it's guns. It was a shoot. So he invites somebody to go shooting with him. And then on Thursday, he takes somebody on his boat because it's a huge boating town. And he owns a boat. And he goes, I love boating. And he goes, and the fun thing about boating is that a lot of people don't have boats that they'd love to go on a boat. They don't invite themselves on a boat. So I have to invite them. So I just say, hey, do you want to go on a boat with me? We'll go fishing. Or we'll just cruise around the lake. So... Uh, breakfast, shooting guns, and going on boats. Sounds like the American dream. But all he's doing is forming and building relationships with those people. And he goes on three appointments a week. But without a doubt, real estate comes up in every single one of those. He has one closing script, which I'm not allowed to say that word anymore, but he's one closing dialogue that he says every time. Who do you know that I should know? And sometimes that's partnered with, who do you know that I should know that would enjoy having breakfast with me next week? Or who do you know that I should know that we should bring to the gun range next time? Who do you know that I should know that would enjoy going fishing with us? So I don't want lead generation to be a dirty word anymore. I want you to look at these lists and say, okay, if I rock it for sale by owners and I don't find pain in that, do that. If there's something that I'm already big into, find a way to turn it into lead generation. And like all jokes aside, like Elise, even with playing Xbox, if you're deliberate about it, you could turn that into a very, very international form of so, lead generation. I actually started recording when I'm playing, whether or not I'm playing by myself with my 10 year old brother or with uh, my fiance and his uncle. And I'm gonna start uploading them to my personal channel, but my business channel is literally the same exact name just with realtor after it so people searching for me are going to see both and i feel like inevitably i'm gonna be like you know every once in a while I'll have like a disclaimer that says 
Um, like if, if you're looking for my professional channel, that's Elise Jenkins Realtor. <laughs> you've, you've found the one that I have for fun. Um, but also what we're doing is we're actually building an overland Jeep. We're building a rock crawling Jeep. And like, that's the YouTube channel that we really want to build. And that's similar to that horse community that I know you and I have talked about because of my deep, very passionate love of horses. Um, and it's very clicky, but I have a lender who is, he has like five people ready to subscribe to my Jeep channel that doesn't even exist yet just by talking to him about it because he is already in that community and he has a trail hawk and his friends build trail hawks and we it turns out we all follow the same four youtube channels so just talk about the things that you're passionate about at like whatever events that you're holding i think that's the biggest thing and um if you guys were at like the ozarks for red day i'm currently editing a nice little video that i went around and filmed at all the locations. Um, sorry, I wasn't down in tri -Lakes to do it, but you could definitely create it on your own with like the still images that everybody collected. I just asked everyone to send me the images that they got while they were out there. And then I captured the prayer that our um, MCA did before we all left. And then um, I interviewed like six agents while we were out and about, but you could do that even now. You could ask them, what does Red Day mean to you? How long have you been participating? You know, what's your favorite part? And that's, I, I literally just asked them those three questions. It's like 45 seconds each interview. And I just like, I have this image in my head and I'm really excited to create it. So, and by no means am I a professional videographer or anything. This is just something that I thought I could do. It could be like my piece that I bring to the table for Red Day because physical labor is not my thing. But I can bring something else to the table. <laughs> so um, I would say just bring your passions and kind of put them put them on the negotiating table too. Well, and, and find your tribe too, right? Like find your, find your community. Um... I'll use the Jeep one because it's it's a it's a really low hanging fruit of an example. Um, oh, there are so I'm many. I'm going to Kansas City next week, and I'm buying a freaking bag of gummy bears. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I look forward to that. Um, but uh, the the Jeep the Jeep uh, community um, for those of you that aren't familiar, like it's 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 not a cult, but like it's a, it's a really tight community that like Jeepers have a Jeep wave and, and Jeepers do meetups and and all these big things all the time. But another fun thing that Jeeps do is they they do this thing where like they'll put a rubber duck on someone's door um, that just is like, hey, nice Jeep. Um, you could You've been go buy a bunch of branded ducks or get a bunch of ducks that tied a ribbon with your business card to them. That'd be no different than door knocking. Right. Well, it's a little bit different, right? This is this is more of one of those passive marketing things that since I'm not having an interaction, but it's the same as if I were to go hang a brochure in someone's house, I'm hanging it on their car instead. So like if you were deliberate and purposeful about it, you could say, hey, my goal is I'm going to go deliver 100 ducks this week. So That's my husband, around. my husband's a Jeep guy. He's got a Jeep. So I'll just give him a bunch of ducks with my stuff on it and he can yeah. do it while he... <laughs> Do you have kids? Get the kids involved. Like my, my kids yeah. love to do. I don't, I think I've ducked in a while because my kids always want to do it. Yeah. Um, but, but like, even if you're not a jeeper, like the, the idea here is like, you can turn anything into prospecting and lead generation. If you look at it the right way. Great yeah. perspective. And then All of right. course my husband will do it for me because he wants me to make money so he can yeah. retire. So <laughs> <laughs> anything Perfect. for him to retire. <laughs> um, my, my challenge would be, you know, if you're turning in the duck, turn it into lead generation. You know, I think oftentimes yeah. we hand out our business cards too much that our number one goal is that we need to be receiving leads, not, not giving our information out. So right. I would picture on the back of your card, your business card, either have a QR code that goes to a contact form with some type of offer of why they need to go to it, or um, just have it like a, like a rebate of like, Hey, fill out your information and send it to me or text me your info and get a free CMA or, you know, whatever your offer is, but get, have a call to action on those cards. Cause otherwise it's a billboard, right? Like we're, we're waiting for people to contact us, but if we can have a contact form or a call to action that scans to a QR code, whatever it is that you want to creatively do, the goal is that we want to get leads from it. Your business card still works on the front page. Let's just make lead generation in the back. 
Or well, maybe you just said a QR code. I know I have a lot. You could, you could, I would test it. Yeah, I would test it. I would see how many of those you give out. Like I would, I would scale that and see, okay, if I'm going to send out 50 out there, I'm going to see how many people actually look at my bit.ly, right? Like yeah. I'm going to see okay. of the 50. Uh, it's just something to test if you're all, if you're going that far out. Um, but we're going to show you, I'm going to show you on these next two screens. Th this is the big page of prospecting and marketing. This is just, the next page is just prospecting. Next page, just marketing. Take a screenshot of this. And what I want you to do, like your assignment is take a look at the two things that you're going to do for prospecting and commit to those two things for the next year. And then we look at marketing. What's the one thing you're going to do for marketing? This is the trap that I think a lot of agents fall into is they look at this page and their mouth waters and they go, I want to do it all. Don't pick one thing, pick two things on mark or on prospecting one on marketing. That's your prospecting page. Give it a five Did count. You say five. Two, two things in prospecting. Two things in prospecting. Okay. One thing for marketing. Oh, I thought we were flipping it. We, well, we are from the original book. The book said be marketing based prospecting enhanced the updates be prospecting based marketing hand. So you should be doing two prospecting things, one marketing. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then here's the marketing screen. Pick one of these. And what I love to kind of comment on this page, if social media is not your thing, don't go in on it. There's no requirement for you to go get a Facebook page because you're a real estate agent. Okay, so um, I just want to clarify, this is for the purpose of lead gen. So mm -hmm. if, like, for example, the only reason why I have anything in print ads is because of my listing appointments. People want to see it even though it's not at all effective. <laughs> yeah, uh, fair, fair enough. So, so there are things that we'll do, we'll do per client, especially when you're dealing with the luxury market. There's a lot of stuff that we do that's a waste of money for us that we do it for them. And there you go. But if it's not like your everyday lead generation, like don't count that. But like, okay, okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. Oh my goodness, the amount of magazines that we we used to subscribe to whenever I was a marketing director for our luxury that were just like they just want to see their house in a magazine that's published nationally and it does nothing for us. It's like I don't know. It's like the ads in the yellow pages. No one, no one looks at it. <laughs> I think they still deliver that that big yellow book, don't they? All right, so let's let's land this plane. Uh, you know, going back to the four laws of a database, um, the current version of the MREA book talks about this idea of having a 33 touch plan. Uh, it says that you need to touch your database 33 times a year to get that 12 to two ratio. The updated version says that we need, in order to get a 10 to one return, we need to do a 36 touch or a 36 to convert is what they're calling it. And it looks like this. Every person in my database needs to get all of these from me in a year. Four phone calls. That's a call once a quarter. 26 bi-weekly emails offering some type of information of value to the consumer. Inside of Command, we have a smart plan for that. It's called the bi-weekly neighborhood nurture, and it absolutely checks off one of those three, three boxes that says, this is making my client smarter. I'm telling them exactly what's going on inside of their neighborhood or where they, wherever the boundary would be for, for that, uh, that touch plan. That's my plan. I'm going to skip the events one. I'm going to move into the, the bottom bullet. For promotional direct mail, such as magnets, calendars, market reports. I don't love the word the calendar in there, but I know that's the thing that we send. I put that in the same bucket as the recipe cards and the, uh, the seed packets. Um, but the idea here is that we're sending four touches that are tangible. This is something that somebody can physically feel four times a year. They can physically hold it four times a year. So that could be a postcard. That could be a pot buy. That could be whatever. It could be a pie at Thanksgiving. Whatever it is, but they're touching, they're, they're getting something they can physically tangibly hold four times a year from you. Now, I want to kind of focus on the two events because I think what we're seeing is that the really smart top agents in our, in our offices are doing way more than two events. At a minimum, they're doing two, but most of them are doing four. They're doing an event in a quarter. Some of them are doing eight a year. And this is why events are so, so impactful. Let's, let's just think about 
the biggest event that I think that we have in our lifetime or we attend in our lifetime are our weddings. Now, weddings aren't designed for lead generation, but let's, let's walk through a, a wedding invitation for a second. So typically, if we want to count the touches that you receive as a guest to a wedding, it's, it goes like this. There's usually an announcement of some sort that we see on social media that somebody's engaged. So like we see a social media touch. Then if we're lucky enough to get invited to the wedding, we get to save the date. That's two. Then we get the actual invitation itself. That's three. Then we get the, um, since you're coming, you're going to get the, the chicken, the beef, or the, uh, the fish card that says, what are you going to have for dinner? You have the event itself. And then if you were nice enough to take a gift, which you probably should have, um, you get a thank you note from the bride and groom. And then typically we do see some more social media, either from guests at that event. And then we also get the official photos probably about a month later, maybe sooner from the, from the actual professional photographer. So in a wedding event, which is not a form of lead generation, right? It's, we're not intentionally getting married to lead generate. We're touching a database, a wedding list eight times. The wedding was number five in all of those. So the reason why events are so successful is that let's just say that you do an event and people don't show up. They still receive seven out of eight touches from you. Nothing else that we saw on that screen before on the different forms of prospecting and marketing will touch your database eight times every time you do it. So the last realtor event that I went to was an invitation to a Kentucky Derby party. Oh, what the heck? Why do I think of things like this? This is ridiculous. My That's whole in your family. wheelhouse, at least. <laughs> this is like a holiday for my whole family. Like my mom takes off work for the Kentucky Derby. Like it's ridiculous. My whole family's from Kentucky. Well, what's what's really funny is it really it was really simple. So um, my realtor is also my boss. So that's why I use them. Um, they they do an event. So they they partner with a local charity and they do gambling. So it's a twenty one it's a twenty one and over event. And basically you pay a $10 donation. It goes to this charity called Chris 180, who, um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah. Um, but it, it goes to uh, Chris 180. So what they do is they combat uh, adolescents in young adult homelessness. So not exactly tied to real estate, but it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's something that's near and dear to the heart. But basically, for everyone who goes, you're, you're open to unlimited bets. But for every $10 I donate, I get one ticket. I put my ticket inside the jar of the winning horse. And whenever horse wins, they pull a ticket and they have a giveaway. My wife happened to one, so I was super thrilled about it this year. Um, but they just gave away their condo in, uh, in Hilton Head for, for, I think, two or three days. But they also had a best dress for the best dressed guy and the best dressed gal. And that person got a, a, a bottle of bourbon. Now, my OP loves bourbon. It's what he's known for. Like we talked about Wild Bill, like my OP, he's the bourbon guy. He has a whole area in his basement that's dedicated to his bourbon drinking. It's wonderful. So it's in tune with who they are. They love giving back to this community, and this cause. They also love bourbon. And this two events tied together beautifully. They had it catered, couldn't cost a lot of money. Um, but that's a fun thing that they invited their database to. And oh yeah, by the way, I got 10 touches from that. Even though I work with them, they still had me in their database. And they got me 10 times. I had calls. I had texts. When I saw them in person, we talked about it. Uh, not to mention, they actually sent me a postcard. Right here. <laughs> Kristen and I have decided that next year we're going to uh, we're gonna co-market an event like this because this is right up our alley here. Yeah. And it's fun. It's fun to enjoy. And the great thing is there was not one conversation or sales pitch of, hey, since we got you, do you want to buy some of us in real estate? It wasn't about that. It was, hey, thank you all so, so much for coming. It's so great to see you. So glad we could do this again this year. Thank you so much for whatever donation you gave to a, a charity that's, that's near and dear to our heart. I built a stronger relationship. He's my boss, but like I would have built a stronger and even stronger relationship with that person. And if it's not the Kentucky Derby, but like the other events they do is they do uh, professional headshots every fall. They also have portraits in the park every spring. You can bring your whole family, not just your own professional headshot. Um, 
Andy, the OP, he does, uh, he does bourbon tasting with his past clients because he has enough of it. He gets gifted it all the time. He just brings out his worst bourbons. He doesn't like, and he gives it to people that don't know bourbon. <laughs> it's a win-win for him. Um, but they have eight events planned every year. They, they uh, actually run out another section of the, the Braves game uh, at, at, in Atlanta. Um, so do all of these things. You can figure out how to do it and scale it down if you can afford those things. Find a way to partner with your mortgage rep. Get somebody else to help pay for these things. But like you can make this work any way within your budget. The goal here is like, we just want to have relationships. It's not about puking real estate. Well, so even like if we rented, um, I don't know, a small like a decent sized room or something, we've got the only inland offshore boat racing race in the country at like the Ozarks every year, every August. So it's like, let's make an event around that where we're watching a live stream together and we have sponsors bringing food for the two days that it's happening or something. Because if you don't have a boat, you want to watch it in air conditioning. Now, if you have a boat, you want to go watch it live on the boats. And I don't have a boat, so I'm one of those people that's watching it with air conditioning. <laughs> I didn't learn how to swim until I was like 25. So yeah, anything with water in me, don't they don't connect. So yeah, I'd yeah. be in the air conditioning with you. That sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, um, that's hard to believe. I think I grew up in a landlocked state, and I just didn't have access to a pool. So yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it, but but like the, the key thing is like make that much like the lead generation part, like make your events uniquely authentically you. You don't have to go do things you don't like. Invite people that like the things, the same things as you do or create experiences. That's the first Kentucky Derby party I ever went to. It was a blast. I'll do it again every year. But the goal is if we do all of these things, if we put our database on 36 touches, which if you do the math, that's just three touches a month. And you can automate two of them. You can get a documented ROI of for every 10 people, I get one, I get one unit. This is amazing. All right. Um, I'm over way, way over on time. Do we have five more minutes? I do. Everybody okay. else We're recording. So if you don't, you can leave and come back to it later. Okay. Um, pull, pull, pull out your phone. This is the fun part where I get to say, pull out your phone. Because if you don't have a database, we're going to get you one today. So open up your phone and go to your contacts. And if you're on an iPhone, this is super easy. I think it's easier on Google, but I don't have a Google phone, so I can't tell you. But go to your contacts. Um, I know on Apple, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, so like if you hit Z and then scroll, it should take you all the way down to the bottom and it will give you your total contact count. Write that number down. We're going to take some notes here. Write that number down. Well, mine's all misconstrued because I have I put the entire BDAR um, real estate board in my phone. Don't worry. Don't worry. That's perfect. That's okay. absolutely perfect. I didn't want to miss a call from an agent when I was first starting out just because I didn't know. Who they no, were. I love it. I actually wanted to hear that 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 objective handler. So you're, you're perfect. Okay. It's like I planted you. Thank you. All right. So what's, what's your number? Write it down. So you're still gonna need your phone for this unless you're a math whiz, but this time open up your calculator. We're gonna do some math. Take that big number, hopefully it's a big number, but take that number of total contacts and divide it by two. What's the two stand for? I'll get to that at the end. I'm gonna, we're gonna do some, some fun math, yeah. We're gonna divide by two. And then you should have another number and we're gonna divide that number by eight. At least what's your average, what's the average um, commission? Like what's an average paycheck for your agents right now? Mm, 7,500. Okay. So now we're going to take that, that new number you have and multiply it by 7,500. Oh no. <laughs> so total number of contacts divided by two, take that number divided by eight and then multiply it by 7,500. Got a good number there. 562. Okay. What's that number for y'all? Go ahead and blab it out. 78 something. 78,000? Yeah. 
Somebody in and Kristen. Oh, Kristen said thirty. Th no, three hundred and fifty-four thousand. Okay. At least you had fifty five hundred something thousand. What was yours? Uh, five hundred twenty or five hundred sixty-two thousand five hundred. Okay, so what that represents now, and I'll explain the math here, is that's how much your phone is worth this year. Wow. That is the amount of commission you have in your phone without adding another lead. So if this is not in a database, get it in a database very quickly. So what we did is we took your total number of contacts. <laughs> so we took your total number of contacts and we divide it by two. And the, and the idea behind this is let's just say that half of your contacts is Pizza Hut and ex-lovers. We're not gonna do any business with Pizza Hut and ex-lovers. They have no space in your database. We're just saying half of your contacts are bad which is pretty conservative. I would say half is very, very, very conservative. Then we're dividing by eight. Why do we divide by eight? What's the significance of the number eight? Um, was it how many? Oh no, I'm guessing, Never mind. If I gave you a range, this may make more sense. You could use any number between seven and 10. How many times you're contacting them directly a year? Uh, we're off target. Good, I like the idea. It's, it's um, how often people are moving. So that eight oh. is based on NAR stats that in 2022, 2022, the people who moved had lived in their home for eight years. On average, historically, it's somewhere between seven and 10. It is just happened to be eight last year. So we're saying now that we divided this, this new number is the total number of units that you have that are people who are going to move in your, in your database, in your phone this year. And then we just multiply it by your average commission because that tells you what your commission is. So that times 7,500 is 7,500 times the number of units you have in your phone this year. So your phone is worth somewhere between, what do we say, 50, 500 and something thousand to over 354,000 from, from Kristen in the chat. Yeah. How many of you have goals smaller than what your phone is worth? Yeah, yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, so we talked a lot today on different ways that you can build relationships with with your leads, and you can go out and get more leads, and you can feed your database. You have a good starting point right here. Connect if it's okay. I'm going to say this. Connect with Elise. We can get this off of here and into into a system. Super Ideally, easy. Connect. They made it way better. Yeah, super super easy. So. Spend 15 minutes with a lease and we can start getting you on a path where you're making six figures. Let's cool. All right. Let's, let's land this plane. Uh, what we learned today, all of these cool things. I just want to hear your ahas. What'd you take away today? What's the most important thing you're going to run with today? My phone's going to make me six figures. Yeah. To scale down my prospecting because I noticed that I do a lot of prospecting. Um, but I need to scale it down and I have an idea of what I want my two things to be. Yeah, we're going hunting with a rifle instead of a shotgun. We're going to get very, very specific <laughs> on what we're targeting. We don't need a widespread. Yep. I love it. Cool. Anyone else want to share? Kristen said the prospecting as well. Right on. Well, I appreciate your time today. Thanks for letting me uh, run over. Hopefully you found the value in staying around for an extra 30 minutes, but um, I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. If you um, have any questions, feel free to reach out to Elise. And Elise, if you can share my contact information, be more than happy to field uh, you know, any thoughts or, or concerns, questions from today, um, uh, if anyone has them. I am just so thankful that you took the time to spend this with us. This was amazing. Um, thank you so much. Oh my gosh. I'm gonna have to watch this over because I feel like there was so much. I listed a condo yesterday and my phone has been blowing up. So I feel like I missed a lot telling people I have to get back to you after this class I'm in. Um, but, um, I feel like this is one we're going to have to watch like every year just to, uh, kind of hone ourselves back in. So I love this. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for coming up. Um, I'm so I was so terrified that we weren't going to have anybody. So thank you for showing up. Thank you for being engaged. 
Um, that's one of the biggest things that I as a trainer struggle with is how to engage you guys. So I'm really glad that you guys participated. Makes it so much more fun um, versus Sam just talking to himself. <laughs> that's one of those personalities I have. Yeah, I talk to myself too. Yeah. Well, you know, we all do. Um, but anyways, thank you guys. If you have questions, like Sam said, reach out. I'll make sure that if I can't answer them, they get forwarded to him and we'll get, we'll keep everybody in touch. Thank you and have a great rest of your week and we'll see you on the next one. See ya. Thank you.